While gaming at 1080p, the 9950X 3D is about 21% faster than the 285K on average. Drop the resolution to 720p and that gap grows to around 27%. But of course, gaming performance is only part of the story. Pricing and productivity performance also plays a big role in deciding between these two. The 285K comes in at roughly $300 less, which gives it a clear lead when you're looking at performance per dollar while gaming. And if you've heard that Intel's new platform costs more overall, that's not the case anymore. Right now, the most affordable Z at 90 boards are priced around the same as entry level X670 or X870 options on the AMD side. And when it comes to memory, AMD tends to hit a good balance at 6000 mega transfers around CL28, which is the kind of setup that you want to get a solid baseline performance, maintaining the one to one ratio on the memory clock and memory controller clock. On Intel, because of its updated memory controller, around 6400 mega transfers CL32 is a better fit for that same role and often ends up being more affordable. If you want to push things a bit, bumping up to 7000 mega transfers CL32 also works well on Intel and it actually matches the cost of AMD's most optimum RAM, with performance scaling nicely with higher memory speeds even when timings aren't super tight. For this test, AMD sent over an X817 Tai Chi motherboard paired with 6000 CL28 for the 9950X 3D. On the Intel side, I'm using an Asus Z890P Wi-Fi along with 7000 CL32 memory for the 285K. We're running these on the latest BIOS and Windows versions. On mostly defaults, AMD with Expo enabled, and on Intel we set XMP2 profile with power limits unlocked but the default Intel profile was set since I found that was the most stable. Now obviously, there's other options out there like Intel's i9-14900K and AMD's non-X3D 9950X. But for this video, I wanted to focus specifically on the latest top tier consumer CPUs from both camps and the most expensive each is offering right now. And just to be clear, if you're building something strictly for gaming, then yeah, something like a 7800X3D or 9800X3D would definitely make way more sense than either of these ships, including the 9950X3D. But if you're someone who's splitting time between gaming, content creation, and general productivity, then this comparison is probably a a lot more relevant. In Puget Bench, a widely respected real world benchmark, Premiere Pro performance was nearly identical between these two CPUs, with the 285K just slightly ahead, and it's really a similar story in DaVinci Resolve, with the 9950X3D trails by less than a percent, which is within the margin of error. However, Photoshop told a different story. AMD pulled noticeably ahead here, showing a 17% advantage, and this lines up with past results where Photoshop tends to benefit from higher cash, as we saw with the 9800X3D. Switching over to more productivity heavy workloads, results from Spec Workstation 4.0, covering tests like Blender, 7-Zip, and LLVM Clang showed very little separation between the two CPUs. Intel has clearly closed the gap here, particularly in compression tasks like 7-Zip though. On the synthetic side, Cinematch R23 gave Intel a 2% lead in multi-threaded performance and a 4% lead in single-threaded, which reinforces just how close these chips are in terms of raw CPU throughput. But when we shift to more sustained real-world workloads, the picture changes. In Handbrake, I encoded one of my own 4K 30fps videos from H.264 to H.265 and the 9950X3D finished the job about 25% faster than the 285K. And that's a meaningful gain if you're regularly dealing with transcoding, but there is of course something called hardware acceleration, which can speed this up anyway using your GPU. In V-Ray Benchmark 6, which uses a ray trace CPU render workload, AMD also pulled ahead with an 18% uplift over Intel. Finally in PC Mark 10, the results were much closer across the board. Digital content creation leans slightly in Intel's favor by 2%, while productivity tasks like spreadsheets and word processing were around 2% faster in AMD. And finally, Essentials, which includes app launches and web browsing, also saw AMD ahead by around 3%. So when it comes to real-world performance across creative and productivity workloads, the 9950X3D and 285 k trade blows more often than not. Intel holds its own in tasks that lean heavily on clock speed and memory bandwidth, while AMD tends to edge ahead in applications that benefit from large cache and more heavily multi-threaded workloads. In a sustained 10-minute 
in a bench throttle test. The 9950X3 holds steady around 4.8 GHz on average, peaking up to around 5.5 GHz before briefly dipping between render cycles, which is totally expected behavior under this load. The 285K behaves similarly. Its E cores stay consistent at 4.6 GHz, while its P cores average around 5.2 GHz topping out at around 5.4 GHz. Where things start to diverge though is power consumption. The 285K draws around 32% more power during the same workload, making the 9950X3 clearly more efficient, which is something to consider again if you're doing long or frequent renders. And that efficiency translates into thermals. On the same high-end air cooler, the Frozen A710, the AMD chip runs around 8 degrees cooler under load, and it's easy to keep in check even with top-tier air cooler. The 285K is manageable, but keep in mind I'm testing this on an open air test bench. Inside a typical case, especially with limited airflow, it could start pushing thermals a bit too close for comfort. We already touched on average gaming performance earlier, but if you're interested in how these CPUs stack up on a per game basis, let's take a closer look, starting with Assassin's Creed Shadows, which is more of a brand new demanding title. And even though it's mostly GPU bound at 1080p, we still saw some measurable CPU impact. AMD's 9950X3 came out slightly ahead with about 1% higher average FPS, 2% better 1% lows, and a more noticeable 8% improvement in 0.1% lows. That last figure reflects smoother frame pacing in heavier scenes, which is something the 3D cache architecture is known to help with, especially in CPU constrained moments. At 720p, where our GPU bottleneck eases and we start to become more CPU bound, the gap sort of widens. The 9950X3 showed 4% better averages, 4% higher 1% lows, and a large 42% uplift in 0.1% lows compared to the 285K. That said, while 0.1% lows can highlight worst case frame drops, they're also more sensitive to micro variations, especially when using the in-game benchmark modes. So while the gain is real, the more consistent and reliable deltas are in the averages and 1% lows, which remained in AMD's favor without being game-changing. Age of Mythology is surprisingly CPU heavy, with a lot happening on screen. Between large unit counts, particle effects, and real-time simulations. At 1080p, AMD held a clear advantage. The 9950X3 delivered a 49% uplift in average FPS, with 1% lows up by 56%, and 0.1% lows improving by 47% compared to the 285K. It's a significant lead that highlights how well AMD's cache-heavy architecture and these busy simulation-driven scenes. But that performance comes at a cost. AMD was drawing around 53% more power in this test, which scales almost linearly with gains in frame rates and frame consistency. At 720p, the gap stayed just as wide with 51% better averages and 59% higher 1% lows for AMD. But interestingly, 0.1% lows only improved by 7%, which suggests that both CPUs experienced similar frame dips at the very low end possibly tied to how the game handles asset streaming or simulation spikes. It's a good reminder that not all low percentile performance gains are purely CPU driven and some edge cases will be title specific. Black Ops 6 is another modern GPU heavy title, but it still puts meaningful stress on the CPU, both in terms of usage and power draw. At 1080p, the performance difference is pretty modest. AMD leads by around 5% in average FPS, 4% in 1% lows, and 6% in 0.1% lows. And power consumption between the two is nearly identical here, with the 9950X3D drawing just 3% more, which isn't quite a linear trade-off for performance uplift, but it's pretty close. Once we drop to 720p and the game becomes more CPU bound, AMD's advantage grows. The 9950X3D pulls ahead by 14% in averages, 7% in 1% lows, and 16% in 0.1% lows. That said, Intel's 285K still holds up particularly well in 1% percent lows where frame pacing still remains strong, so while the numbers show a clear AMD lead, the actual experience in game is more competitive than the deltas might suggest. In Far Cry 6, AMD shows a clear advantage in average frame rates, where at 1080p the 9950X3 led by 48%, which is a pretty substantial jump. But when we look at 1 and 0.1% lows, the gap starts to narrow, AMD holding a 40% lead in 1% lows, and just a 27% lead in 0.1% lows 
formulas, which suggests that Intel still delivers solid frame consistency even behind this raw throughput. At 720p, this trend continues. AMD extends its lead slightly and averages to 52%, but again, the margin shrinks and lows, with only a 38% uplift in 1% lows and a 24% uplift in 0.1% lows. The key takeaway here is that average FPS does not tell the whole story. While AMD clearly leads in peak performance, Intel still maintains competitive frame pacing, especially in those critical low percentile moments that really affect gameplay the most. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider continues this trend. At 1080p, AMD leads by 29% in average FPS, but that advantage drops sharply when looking at frame consistency, just 7% higher in 1% lows and barely a 1% gain in 0.1% lows. And to achieve that high average, AMD draws around 22% more power, and given how little it helps in smoothing out frame pacing, the trade-off feels sort of less meaningful. At 720p, where the CPU becomes more of a factor, the gap in averages widens to 37%, but again 1% lows improve by only 9%, and 0.1% lows remain essentially flat. So while AMD clearly delivers more raw performance, there's no doubt about that, the overall experience isn't dramatically smoother, and in this case, Intel holds this ground surprisingly well where it counts. Our penultimate game, F124, marks a clear turning point though, as Intel's typical solid frame consistency finally gives way to AMD's full advantage here. At 1080p, the 9950X3D led by 30% in average FPS, with even bigger gains in smoothness, with 41% higher 1% lows and 52% higher 0.1% lows. Dropping to 720p only widens the gap though, as AMD extends its lead to 45% in averages, with 40 and 50 52% gains and 1 and 0.1% lows respectively. This is a title where AMD's 3DB cache really starts to shine. It significantly reduces reliance on system memory, and that shows in both frame time stability and overall performance scaling. Our final game, Counter Strike 2, continues the trend seen in F124, with AMD holding a clear edge overall, though both CPUs deliver excellent performance and averages. At 1080p, AMD leads by around 9% in average FPS. So in a title like this, where frame rates are already extremely high, you're unlikely to notice that difference, even on high refresh rate monitors. Where it does matter though is in the lows, where AMD pulls ahead by 45% in 1% lows and 30% in 0.1% lows, which can noticeably improve responsiveness and consistency in fast paced moments. At 720p, as the game becomes more CPU limited, AMD's lead widens slightly with a 14% uplift in averages and around 38% in low percentile performance. And these last two titles really highlight how cache sensitive workloads benefit from AMD's 3D vCache, particularly in games where frame pacing and responsiveness matter just as much as raw frame rates. Before we wrap up, let's quickly touch on performance per watt or overall efficiency across the games that we just tested. Technically AMD's 9950X 3D is more efficient, but only really by around 1%, despite drawing 23% more power on average than the 285K. So in that context, Intel isn't actually that far behind. Now for most gamers, power efficiency isn't a major concern, they're often willing to trade a bit more power draw for extra performance, which is what the 9950X3D does, and that trade-off makes sense for the use case. It's also worth noting that the 285K may actually have some headroom for overclocking, which could help close the remaining performance gap even further, which adds even more value to an already strong price of performance package. That said, overclocking always comes with diminishing returns and results will vary depending on silicon quality and thermals. We didn't explore overclocking in today's video, but that's something we plan to cover soon, including PBO2 and Curve Optimizer on AMD, and also manual tuning on Intel. So if you're interested in that, be sure to get subscribed as you won't want to miss it. So overall, it's clear that the 9950X3D and the Ultra 285K are both extremely capable, but they do serve different priorities. AMD's 9950X3D consistently pulls ahead in gaming, whereas 3D Vcache architecture 
shines. It also delivers strong performance and sustained workloads like encoding and rendering, where multi-threaded efficiency and thermal behavior really start to stand out. For those working with heavier content creation tasks alongside gaming, it's a compelling if premium choice. Although, as I mentioned, the 285K comes in at $300 cheaper, and it's crucial to highlight that this lower price doesn't automatically mean it's a purely budget-friendly alternative. Instead, it represents genuinely an excellent value delivering competitive performance across nearly every scenario tested. And it's actually the smarter choice in my opinion for those who prioritize overall cost efficiency without sacrificing much on meaningful performance. So while the 9950X 3D often holds the leading gaming benchmarks, it's important to emphasize that the 285K delivers consistently excellent frame time smoothness and responsiveness. And in real world gaming scenarios, the differences, though measurable, may not always translate into noticeably superior gaming experience, which makes Intel's price to performance ratio actually even more compelling. If you found this video helpful, consider subscribing as we've got some more deep dives coming, including overclocking, cooling comparisons, and platform longevity. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.